أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم إن شاء الله today and every night we will have either coffee or tea in the back so I know it's very late so feel free to go in the back and grab a cup إن شاء الله Also, tomorrow we have a surprise for you, a surprise guest in place of me. So we're going to have a brother who can actually speak Urdu. So he'll come. Uh, so I don't know if I should reveal the name or keep it as a surprise. Uh, inshallah. So you'll see tomorrow night will be um, a great Imam, a friend of mine. Oh, Farak by How are you? Imam Joe. So you're here. I have to give the name now. Imam Jawad, Jawad Bai is going to come tomorrow and he's going to deliver this lecture in place of me in Urdu language, inshallah. So we will benefit from that. So again, coffee in the back, feel free to take it now. I don't mind, inshallah. So today we recited Juz 2. We're on the second day of Ramadan and it's going very fast. Uh, first day of Ramadan, but the second night of Taraweeh. It's going very, very fast. And I wanted to share today a passage from the Qur'an. The only place in the Qur'an where Allah speaks about Ramadan. There is an important passage in Surah Al-Baqarah in the second juz where Allah gives us the lessons concerning Ramadan. This is, you know, if you want to know the rules of Ramadan, you want to know the fiqh of Ramadan, this is the only place you'll find it in the Qur'an. But my what I wanted to share today, and inshallah Allah gives us the tawfiq for that, I want you to see how Allah teaches us and compare that to the way human beings teach. Just keep this idea in the back of your minds. I want you to compare Allah's way with the way of human beings. And hopefully by the end of the lecture you will fall in love with the way Allah teaches us. You will realize the mercy and the love that Allah has for us. So when it comes to fasting, when your non-Muslim friends or neighbors ask you what the fast is about, you all have to explain yourself. So we have different ways of, of, of teaching our colleagues and even our children. If you are to write an article for the local newspaper about Ramadan, what will you write? What is it about? So all of us, if you open up a book of fiqh by our fuqaha, you look up Kitab al-Siyam in any of the hadith books, Jazakallah. You will find fasting or something to this effect. Fasting is not eating, not drinking, maybe we'll add not smoking, not having relations with your spouses from dawn to dusk. This is how it's defined by us, by human beings. So the fuqaha will define al-imsaku an al-mufattarat min tulu' al-fajr ila ghasq al-layl, for instance. It's fasting is to abstain from the things that break the fast, and there are a number of things, from the time the sun rises, or at the fajr time actually, until sunset. So this is our definition, the definition of human beings. We teach our children, don't drink, don't do this, don't do that. And I'm not saying that's incorrect. Of course it's correct. We know what breaks the fast. But now let's take a journey through the Quran together in a few moments to show how Allah speaks about Ramadan. How He teaches His servants about Ramadan. And again, this is the only place in the Quran where He mentions Ramadan. Only one verse mentions Ramadan by name and this is the passage. It's very rare you'll find all the teachings relating to one act of worship in one place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by saying, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum musiyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. This is an introductory verse. There's no real rule here. It's just teaching us all believers, fasting is obligatory for you, like it was obligatory for nations before you, so that you may attain taqwa. This is giving you purpose, giving you the mindset, and telling you, what frame of mind you should be in before you begin the month of Ramadan. Jazakallah. So, but we want to focus on teaching, getting into the details of Ramadan. So now, 
if you haven't read the Quran, you're probably expecting, okay, let's see where the verse tells you, you can't eat, you can't drink. Let's see where those rules are. Because human beings, we love rules. Human beings, we focus on prohibitions. Human beings, this is what we emphasize. When there's a class on Ramadan, what is the number one topic? What are we emphasizing? Do not do this, do not do that. Um, some of us might say, don't brush your teeth, or don't do this, or uh, smoking, does that break your fast, or inhaling this and that. We have all these questions about the mufattarat. So now this is Allah teaching us. So he introduces us to the purpose of Ramadan, that's very important, but the first thing he says in the next verse, now this is where the rules and the details start coming. He says, ayyaman ma'dudat, two words. He says, just a few days. What does that mean? This is a reminder from Allah that look, don't worry. It might seem hard to you. Fasting might seem daunting. When we explain to our non-Muslim neighbors, we don't eat or drink, not even water for an entire month, their jaws drop. And they say, entire month? Then he said, no, 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 no. We, in the, during the night, we're able to do so. But still, an entire month is very daunting, very intimidating. So why doesn't Allah say one month? It's only one month. Imagine the verse said, shahrun wahidun, or something like that. But Allah says, just a handful of days. It's, an, it's, it's a reminder, look, don't worry. It's a love, it's the mercy from Allah, giving us this style, this message. Don't worry, it's going to pass so quickly. And it really is just a couple of days. Today was the second taraweeh. Can you imagine? Ramadan is already in full swing. How fast did it go? Before you know it, we're going to be talking about the Eid preparations, where you're going to be praying, and so on and so forth. It's going to be over like this. So this verse in Allah's style, just two words, Allah is giving us a warning. That's just a few days, take advantage of them. He's also inspiring us. Look, don't worry. It's just a few days. And then Allah continues. Now the rules are getting more detailed. So the next thing Allah says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ Whoever of you is ill, sick, or on a journey, make up those days of fasting on, on other days outside of Ramadan. So the first real rule of Ramadan Allah teaches us is an exception, right? If you're sick or on a journey, make it up on other days. Where do you find those exceptions in human books, in books of fiqh? First, there's all these discussions, pages of what you can't do, not eating, not drinking, so on and so forth. And then we get to the exceptions, because human minds, we work like that. We list the things that you're not, you're those things that are prohibitions. That's what excites us. That's what we emphasize to our uh, colleagues. And then we mention the exceptions at the end. Allah, the first rule he shared with us Ramadan, we're learning the fiqh of Ramadan, the rules of Ramadan. The first thing is an exception. First, he says, don't worry, just a few days. Then, don't worry. If you're sick, if you're on a journey, make it up on other days. You can see the, 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 the message of the way of Allah teaching human beings. You can almost see the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because it's not really about those mufattarat, about those things that you're supposed to abstain from. Allah does not care about that. Allah will gain nothing from us not eating or drinking. But fasting is for our benefit. So Allah begins with the exception before the rule. So that's an important lesson. You have to reflect and make the dabbur. Think about that. You know, that's a mercy of Allah. And so one of the things you'll find in these verses, there's so many, every other word, every other portion is dripping with Allah's mercy. And this idea that this is supposed to be easy. Allah doesn't want hardship for us. Allah doesn't want to make things difficult for us. So this is the first thing he teaches. If you're ill or on a journey, make it up on other days. And then he says, Those who can fast have the option of fidya, which is ransom, literally ransom, but it's to feed a poor, poor person for every day that you missed. What is it speaking about? So there's a historical background of this verse, but there's something it means for us today. There's nothing in the verses abrogated that we recite for no reason. There's some lesson for us, as we shared last night. Imam al-Ghazali said, there's not a, 
illa wa siyaquha lifa'idatin. There's not a single story or anything mentioned in the Quran except that it has a message for us. So initially fasting, when Allah legislated fasting in the history of the prophetic era, it was optional. Those who were able to do it, but they still had the option of fidya. But eventually fasting became obligatory. So now what this verse means, those who are able to fast, but doing so would harm them or it would be very difficult extraordinarily difficult for them. Those who are able to fast but can do so only with great difficulty, let them make it up on other days. Who is this speaking about? Those who have chronic illnesses. If you have a regular illness, what's the verse? فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا If you're ill, you make it up on other days. But what would this apply to? Those who are not able to make it up on other days. What would be that scenario? Someone elderly. He's not going to get his youth back. Or someone who has a chronic illness, there's no ch chance of cure. Terminal cancer, for instance. There are so many illnesses where the doctor will tell you that there's very little chance of cure, that we're just trying to control symptoms and it's just, there's no hope of significant recovery. So chronic illnesses, elderly, they have this option of fidya. So, so far it's still exemptions. It's still a message of mercy and ease. And then Allah says, وَأَنْتَ سُومُ Fasting is so good for you if you only knew. Again, encouraging us, motivating, inspiring us. Allah wants us to fast. He doesn't need us to fast. And He's inspiring us. Then the next verse, a few more rules. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Now Allah tells us why Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is a month Allah revealed His book, His words to mankind. This is the Quran. And then Allah describes the Quran with three things. Hudan linnas, guidance for humanity. Wabayinati min al huda, a clear presentation of guidance. Wal furqan. Furqan means that which separates right from wrong, shows you right from wrong. So just think what's the message here? Three things Allah says. I mean, think about the, the message from yesterday. The entire Quran is a book of huda from beginning to end. So Allah says, guidance for humanity, a clear guidance, and a guidance that shows you right from wrong. So the message here is, Quran is guidance, the Quran is guidance, the Quran is guidance. Allah is just emphasizing that. And then He says, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ He says one more time, if you are sick, or you're on a journey, make up on other days. Now think about that. He, didn't he just say that in the previous verse? What is repeated? There must be a reason. There's nothing random in the book of Allah. It has to be a reason. The fact that Allah shares it twice, He knows that people are difficult. We tend to make things difficult. That's our nature. So He's reminding us of this rule. So there's no mistake. You know, in Ramadan, when you see someone not eating, we shame them. Oh brother, fear Allah. Why are you fasting? Oh, come on, what kind of illness do you have? But what about making excuses for your brother? How about Allah sharing twice? If you're ill or you're traveling, make it up on other days. So this is, so the, 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 the message cannot be mistaken. And Allah wants mercy for us. Allah wants ease for us. And then he says, the reason for repeating this, the next thing he says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسُرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسُرُ this is one of the fundamental verses in the Quran that really deserves to be framed. It's one of the summaries of Allah's Sharia, the mankind. Allah wants for you ease. He does not want for you hardship. This deen is about ease and not about hardship. There are many Muslims, their style or their message is always to make things difficult for us. And there are many, perhaps speakers, perhaps scholars, they're always speaking in ways that make things difficult. And it's all almost as if Islam is meant to be hard. And I've heard this from a number of speakers. This is the message that they give. Islam is meant to be hard. You have to get out of bed for Fajr. You have to. But look at, would you take a human being's word or would you take the word of Allah Azza wa Jal? Allah says this several times in the Quran. Um, this kind of message. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسُرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسُرُ Then he says, وَلَيْتُكْمِلُ الْعِدَّةِ Now this is about the end of Ramadan. 
complete the days of Ramadan to so complete the days and say the takbirat this is speaking about what? the day of Eid and then تشكرون, so that you may be grateful so Ramadan began with the first verse and it ends on the day of Eid this is a summary of your life your life should begin with taqwa and end with shukr. Every single thing that we are involved in should begin with taqwa, which is keeping a line mind. That's why we say bismillahir rahmanir rahim when we do everything. And it should end with shukr. That's why when we end everything, we say alhamdulillah. When we drink our coffee, when we eat our food, at the end we say alhamdulillah. This is the other. Beginning with taqwa, ending with shukr. And then finally, the last verse we want to look at there's a verse, um, the next verse is speaking about dua. So Allah interjects here a message about dua. But then the final verse is the longest verse of the passage. It's almost half a page. This contains the real rules of Ramadan. So those of you who are sitting, waiting for the rules, here they are. So now you would imagine, okay, now if you have a verse that teaches you the rules of Ramadan. So we want to list, okay, what we can do. So it's forbidden to eat or drink and so on and so forth. So what should the verse begin with? Should be forbidden for you or such and such. But what does the verse begin? What's the first word in this verse? Who remembers the first word? halal. The word is halal. Uhilla is a verb form of halal. So Allah does not say haram for you is eating, drinking and the relations. But Allah says halal for you. So the real uh, the major verse of the Quran that deals with most of the rules and the conclusion of the, the of, of this passage begins with the word halal uh, permitted for you on the nights of Ramadan is to have sexual relations with your spouses so just think about that for a moment this is the final verse even in that final verse, you're not getting a message of don't eat, don't drink, don't have relation. But the message is permitted for you is to have lawful sexual relations with your spouses. Beautiful uh, uh, description. They are your garments and you are garments for them. Allah knows you are tested. In the beginning of Ramadan, it was forbidden even to eat and drink after you had fallen asleep during the night and have relations with your spouses. It was very difficult. Allah says that He has forgiven you for all those lapses. And He says, Fal'ana, now, bashiruhunna, wabtagu ma katab Allahu lakum, wa kulu washrabu. Now He describes, going even more detailed, now you are allowed to have relations with your spouses. And Allah commands you, have relations with them. And eat and drink. So now the only time, the first time Allah mentions eating and drinking, what does He say? Don't eat, don't drink? No, it's a command to eat and drink. So eat and drink. Min al -fajr. So eat and drink, have relations until you can distinguish the white thread from the black thread. This is the Fajr time. So think about that, brothers and sisters. When your non Muslim neighbors ask you, what is Ramadan, or your bosses, or your employees, or co workers ask you, what is Ramadan? Instead of telling them, well, Ramadan is a month where we can't eat or drink or have anything by mouth, what if you told them, a different message and use the Quranic style. What if you told them Ramadan is a month where we have parties at night, where we enjoy at night, we eat and drink at night, we enjoy our families at night? That's what the Quran says. So it's true, during the day we don't eat and drink, during the night we do this, but what are you going to highlight? Which portion are you going to focus on? Human beings will focus on the daytime and focus on what's impermissible. And haram for you, this and this and that. But Allah, Arhamur Rahimin, 
Allah was full of love for us. Al Wadud, Al Rahim, Al Rahman. This is His way of teaching us the fiqh of Ramadan. Never did He say even once, don't eat, don't drink so far. But He did command us to eat and drink. And the first word is halal, not haram, uhilla lakum. And then He says, Thumma atimu siyama ila layl at the end. He says, at the end, and then, so mentioning the night, in the night, eat and drink and have relations until the Fajr time. Thumma atimu siyama ila layl. This is only portion where he mentions the fast, not eating, not drinking. But he says it in passing. And then, you know, complete the fast until the night. So Allah is highlighting the entire night. And then when the Fajr time comes, the black thread, the white thread, then he just says in three words, Thumma atimu siyama ila layl. It just goes very, very fast. This is the mercy of the creator of human beings. What kind of, like, do you get a message like this from the books of human beings? From the books of fuqaha? And I'm not saying we shouldn't write these books. Of course, this is our tradition. This is how we learn. But just this should reinforce to you how Allah teaches versus the way of human beings. So this is amazing, absolutely amazing. The shift in perspective that comes from Allah's way of teaching. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, same thing. He was, he, he was a living Qur'an. He recited the Qur'an, he lived the Qur'an, and he was very similar. You might say, okay, well, the Qur'an doesn't say don't eat and drink. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have said that. So find me a hadith. There are so many hadith about fasting. Find me a hadith where the Prophet said, maybe there is, I just don't, I'm not aware of. Their prophet would say haram is for eating and drinking and so on and so forth. But there's so many hadith. Allah's uh, messenger said, for instance, لَيْسَ الصِّيَامُ مِنَ الْأَكْلِ وَالشُّرْبِ Fasting is not about eating or drinking. إِنَّمَا الصِّيَامُ مِنَ الْلَغْوِ وَالرَّفَثِ Sallallahu alayhi wa He said fasting is not about eating or drinking. But it's really about لَغْوِ rafath, Immorality, heedlessness and things like that. He said in a hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلُ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةً فِي أَنْ يَدَعْ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابًا Whoever does not give up lying and false talk, Allah has no need for him or her to give up their food or drink. So even in the sunnah, even in the words of the Prophet, the emphasis is not on these things. The emphasis is on what fasting is really about. The emphasis, the message is a message of mercy. So this is the message, this is what I wanted to share with you today. This is this, this entire passage here. Um, Allah is so merciful. His Quran is so beautiful. It is so remarkable. It's something that touches the heart. So you just have to think about these things. This message you might not get from tafsir. If you read the tafsir, it'll tell you in the footnotes all these things that are important to know. But sometimes you just have to listen to the words of Allah. Like we said yesterday, Imam al-Ghazali, is the, what, the, what does guidance look like? Qira'a bil lisan, and then the, the mind, yani the mind understands what you're reading, and then it reflects, tadabbur uh, bil aql, and then wa'ad bil qalb, that three-prong, uh, qira'a, tadabbur, and then amal. So it starts with reciting, and then tadabbur means to repeat and keep thinking about the message and just ask yourself questions. Why Allah says this? And when you reflect over that in your prayer, that's what Qiyamul layl is. You reflect over that in your prayers, then it affects your heart. When it settles in your heart and it becomes tabsiratan wa dhikra, then it motivates you to action. And then you implement what you, what you read. And that's really what guidance is. May Allah give us the tawfiq to recite the Quran as it ought to be recited. May Allah reward all of you for patiently listening at this late hour. May Allah reward our late Sheikh Yusuf Islahi, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, who started this tradition. And may everything good that happens in this place and in this position uh, be added to his skills and raise his ranks. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Questions? Okay. So some some brothers pointed out yesterday, Maulana Saab used to answer questions. Um, I remembered in my mind, Thursdays were, were for questions. Every Thursday, right? So.
as someone mentioned every day he would answer questions so inshallah uh, yes brother uh, mas that's a good question. How do we take steps to Tadabra? Of course, the answer will be different depending on the position uh, and the state of the person. Ideally, the person should know Arabic. If you know Arabic, then the process is the process of the Prophet and the companions which is just recited during the night, in your night prayers, Qiyamul Layl. And Qiyamul Layl, just enjoy it, read it, repeat verses. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ sometimes spent the entire night repeating one verse. So that's the Imam Ghazali emphasizes a lot. When you're reading, try to reflect over the meaning, so keep repeating those verses until you get the meaning. And this, it's some of the Sahaba, what they used to do, if, if they read something and their mind wasn't in it, they would go back. So in that way, they would keep reading. So they weren't geared towards, they weren't prioritizing finishing Quran, but they were prioritizing getting the message and tadabbur on what they were reading. And often they didn't read as much as other people. So for those who know Arabic, of course, that's, that's the proper way. Um, Quran is meant to be recited, not meant to be read. It's not a written book, it's an oral kalam of Allah. So it's meant to be recited. not if you have a choice between sitting down and reading so in the as Hassan al-Basri says but they used every single night and initially it was mandatory upon the community so that's the ideal situation Qiyam layl reciting the Qur'an, reflecting over it, repeating it, um, and it could be any portion. There's no specific guideline. Of course, Surah Al-Fatiha is there in every rak'ah. There is no rak'ah without Surah Al-Fatiha, and then you pick a portion. Now, the more difficult question is those who don't speak Arabic, don't understand Arabic. So for that, obviously, we have to rely on translations. There are a number of remarkable translations. So how do you do that in your prayers? That's challenging. And prayer is very difficult to do. You have to recite in Arabic, generally speaking. Most scholars say you have to read in Arabic, recite in Arabic, so you don't read the English. So, so that kind of eliminates the prayer, which is a proper way for many people who don't understand Arabic. So then you recite the Quran from a Mus'haf. So the advice there would be always recite with meaning. Always have the translation and a good basic tafsir. Um, but don't get distracted by that. That's that's the message we gave yesterday. That often tafsir can take you into tangents, take you into the past, all the stories, and you get lost in them. So that's the danger of tafsir. So you're supposed to read the Quran and have a basic tafsir or translation next to it and think about it. And if there's difficult passage, don't worry. Move on. Um, it will come to you eventually. That's what people like Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, they would recite. And sometimes they, wouldn't, they would think about a mas'ala or verse of the Qur'an, and they would be patient. They would keep reading and they would make istighfar and in their prayers, ask Allah to open their hearts. And eventually they would come across, you know, the what they weren't understanding previously. So have some regular process of reciting Qur'an with meaning and translation for those who don't speak Arabic. There really is no other shortcut. Wallahu a'ala. So that, that's a tough question. It, in, in the nafal prayers, the non-fard prayers, non-obligatory prayers, um, many scholars say you can. And I believe the matter is kind of flexible in Qiyamul Layn and Tahajjud. So you should do it in a way that's not that distracting. Um, so you do it in a way with Arabic side by side. Um, you know, apps are good for that, but the thing with apps is you'll get a notification from Facebook. Someone sent you a message. What are you going to do then in the Salah? So try to put the app in the phones on airplane mode if you use an app. Or have a Quran that's side by side, you know, that doesn't have a lot of switching pace. 
the whole Arabic is here and the English is on the side. So you can at least look over that. Don't read the English out loud, but read the Arabic out loud and just glance at the translation. So you can do that in Qiyamul Layl, inshallah. So, this is a, uh, a good question, but it means you weren't paying attention. Um, <laughs> yesterday, I ha you haven't read Imam Ghazali's Ihya al or what many of these scholars uh, were talking about. So, what they were teaching us is that every single one of you has to have a personal relationship with the Quran. And tadabur means you think or reflect over the Quran. Tadabur does not mean I give you some gems and you read my gems, or you read a tafsir and you um, you look at someone else's tadabur. Yes, there's a scope for that and room for that. Of course, you want to read what great minds have written about the Quran, but that doesn't take, that would not be your tadabur. So each one of you has to have your own tadabur, your own reflection, because then you're just listening to someone else and you're just using their understanding and that's not really affecting your heart. Sometimes it's something you might be impressed by, but that's not that process of qira'ah, tadabbur, and amal. That process of tongue, mind, and heart, as Imam Ghazali talked about. That can only come when you discover a passage. You're reading it on your own initiative. You're doing it with worship, with intention of worship, and in the worship. Then you discover these meanings, and it's like the Qur'an is speaking to you. That will never come if I tell you, you know what, read this verse tonight, read this verse tomorrow. So you're just following me. So that will be less of an, less impactful on your heart than you reciting the Quran. The beauty, beautiful thing about the Quran is it's, it's a complete and coherent book. There's no contradiction in it beginning to end. You can open it up on any page. You can start with any surah. I mean, there's an order of the Quran, Fatiha to An-Nas, but you're not obligated to do that. You can read any surah and it will speak to you. It will, it will give you some guidance. It will give you, it will, it will affect your heart. And a lot of people who have a relationship with the Qur'an, they tell you the same thing. They will tell you this, that every time they have a question, just randomly the answer will, will be in the Qur'an, in their regular readings. So have some regular way of reciting the Qur'an, but don't look for, like the true culture we have, a wazifa, right? Give us a wazifa, give us a dua, give us which passages to read and how many times. So people want even, which verse should I read for this and how many times should I read each verse? That's not real tadabbur. That's not a real relationship with the Quran. Your relationship with the Quran would, should be unique and personal. As Imam Ghazali said, taqsis. You should consider that this book is addressed to you. Every single verse is for you. Allah sent a letter, a message to you, each and every one of you. That only comes from your own effort. And uh, inshallah, if you develop this habit of reciting the Quran on Qiyamul Layl every night, or some other regular way of reciting at some portion. Just make it regular and Allah will do wonders for you, inshallah. Okay, Fatahullah alaikum. Alhamdulillah, now we finished 15 minutes earlier than yesterday. So again, tomorrow, uh, Jawad Bai will be here. And I've asked him to speak in Urdu if that's not a problem. Is there anyone who doesn't speak Urdu here? Maybe if we do one or two nights. Uh, Okay, inshallah. Yeah,